so everyone could be you know ease their concerns about justin's well-being now because he's here with us and it's well, episode wait, wait wait a second 277 wait a second. of the tank podcast <laughs> I, look the only reason i'm back okay is not is not because you know i actually care about this show because i don't clearly <laughs> the reason i'm back is because i need to dispel these <laughs> QAnon like conspiracy theories that have that have arisen <laughs> since I left, where everyone thinks that I'm somehow dead, or that like you know I've been fired arrested at the Capitol, arrested at that, the Capitol. Yeah, yeah, like I'm the guy who's stealing the podium at the Capitol. That ain't me. That no, isn't that me. guy was no, that guy was way too tall to be you. Can you well, let Donnie? That, can you let Donnie finish yeah, opening the show before you start your rant? Editorial director at the Heartland Institute. All right, he already introduced himself. Isaac, a <laughs> research fellow at the Center of the American Experiment. How are you, good sir? It's Policy Fellow, but I'm great. Policy Fellow, I always mess that up. Jim Likely, VP of the Heartland Institute. How are you, good sir? I'm doing okay. Um, I sure feel better now that the our, our political and ruling class and our media betters have done all they can to unite the country and turn the temperature down, and I'm sure all our listeners do too. Yeah, good point, good point, and we will get to that, and I am... Racing through this intro a little bit because I've got an interview with a producer of that movie that I kind of referenced at the end of last episode, Run, Hide, Fight, that we're going to do an interview with him later, Dallas Sonier. Um, so that's coming up in the second half of the episode, but I do want to get to some of these topics. Parlor uh, is at the forefront of all of our minds, getting taken down, destroyed, murdered on behalf of the tech giants. But before we get any of that, I do want to start off the show with a conspiracy theory. Okay? So follow me, guys. And I want I want your opinion on this. But uh, my conspiracy is that Joe Rogan uh, was essentially silenced with money and taken out. Uh, his, his cultural influence has been destroyed by him taking this deal with Spotify, where he's essentially just doing a show in a closet where nobody's listening anymore. So that's my that's my theory. What do you guys think? That's an expensive theory. $100 million contract to sit in a closet and have no influence anymore. Yeah, At least he got hey, paid. Chump change for the powers that be. Uh, he was like, seriously, I don't think this is an overstatement. One of the most influential people, uh, public figures of the last, I don't know, five, ten years. And now people don't even know if he's got a show anymore because nobody watches him on Spotify. I floated this theory out to a dozen people that I know that uh, routinely listened to him, regularly listened to him. And half of them weren't even sure he was recording episodes anymore. They're like, is he taking a break? Like, no, he's got a show. It's on Spotify. Nobody listens to it. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's, I think that what is true beyond a shadow of a doubt is that on the left, he was the most popular, reasonable person right. <laughs> that existed. I mean, there's lots of popular people on the left who are totally unreasonable, but he was the most popular, reasonable person. And and he was skeptical of many of these really gigantic government overreaches. Yep. And so, you know, do I think it's a conspiracy theory? No, because similar things have happened like this before. They clearly not conspiracy theories. Uh, you know, like, for example, Jim will probably remember this. Um, uh, remember when Howard Stern was like the most popular person in the universe in radio. Mm -hmm. And then Howard Stern went to Sirius XM radio, or I think it was, I don't even know if they were merged at the time, but he went to satellite radio and then he just didn't matter anymore. All sure. of a sudden who cares about Howard Stern? Cause now he's on satellite radio. Yeah. And so I, I feel like that's Joe Rogan, right? And he probably knew that when he took the deal, hmm. but you know, it's a lot of money. So who can blame him? So I don't know if it's a conspiracy theory. It's probably just we've seen big media make these mistakes before with these with these hosts. And I think this was probably just another example of it. I think it's a shame. I mean, he was definitely a crusader for things that, uh, you know, we hold dear first first uh, first amendment, second amendment uh, advocate. And now, yeah, people don't even know he's got a show. So what a shame. Well, maybe you should get Spotify premium. Eh, well, I'm not going to do that. I actually right. do have Spotify, by the way, and yeah, I don't ever great. listen to a show. I, I have, have Spotify. I have Spotify too, and again, <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Um, all right, well, and let's not beat around the bush. Let's get to the uh, the aftermath of of you know what happened with the whole Capitol siege siege on the Capitol. So. After we recorded that episode last week, wait, Justin wasn't on the show last week, was he? No. 
Ah. Yeah, that's the conspiracy. <laughs> so the Twitter took down Trump because of some things that he said. And then... Uh, <laughs> that's a great and, description. Yeah. And go, then, go on. <laughs> and then... Uh, uh, so then, you know, like throughout that Friday... Uh, Friday afternoon, Friday night, we got word that Parler, which Justin and I have been investing a lot of time into with our Stopping Socialism project, Parler was going to be taken off of the app stores by Apple and Google. So, uh, you know, it stinks, but it's not the biggest deal in the world. Like, you could still download the app. It wasn't a big deal. And then that night, we found out that Amazon was going to be basically kicking Parler off their servers, which is effectively just destroying the entire app. Uh, this this alternative to Twitter is just in the dustbin of history until further notice. So, Justin, I think you also had a pretty kind of passionate response to this. Uh, what did you think when you heard this news coming down? I mean, I was... I feel like a lot of people who are on the right have been talking about this day where it would be like, you know, there's going to be this purge. This purge is coming. It's coming. The social media giants, they are eventually going to just wipe us all away. It's going to happen. And we've been talking about it and worrying about it. And then it sort of happened. I mean, it, it didn't fully happen, but it, it happened in a way that is more extreme than it has ever happened before. They, they took a platform that was really the only alternative that conservatives had the only alternative social media uh, platform that had grown exponentially over the past two years from essentially nothing to no one at all in 2018 when it launched to, uh, I saw the the CEO of Parler the other night on Tucker Carlson say that at the end they had essentially almost 20 million users Mm -hmm. on Parler. Okay. So they went from nothing to 20 million in two years. All right. That's incredible. That's incredible. And every major conservative figure was on Parler Everyone was starting to shift their attention on the right to moving to Parler because we just gave up trusting uh, the the establishment social media empire. And um, when they killed it, and they killed it as quickly as they did, and they did it in such a coordinated way, it, it despite the fact that we've been talking about it for so long, it still surprised me a little bit right. the way that it happened. I mean, they just absolutely murdered this thing overnight. And it wasn't just... Apple, and it wasn't just Google, and it wasn't just Amazon. It was every third-party vendor that they had. It was every service that they had, digital service. They all canceled. In fact, the CEO of Parler said that they found out from some of their vendors that they were canceling, having their service canceled through media outlets that were reporting it. They hadn't even been notified yet by it. And at one point uh, earlier in the week, the CEO of Parler said that the only service that they had left was their email. That was it. Everything else associated with this had been wiped out. And why was it wiped out? Well, we're told it was wiped out because they were allowed to uh, have people on the platform who were saying things, uh, saying violent things and encouraging violence and organizing that had something to do with the Capitol protests and all of that. Um, and I'm sure that there were people on, on on Parler doing that. But there were also people on Twitter doing that. And there were people on Facebook doing that. And those, those platforms didn't get destroyed as a result of that. And so this was, it was so obvious and so transparent what had happened here. The left was waiting for a moment to kill Parler because Parler was finally becoming a legitimate alternative to their power. Yeah. And they seized on that opportunity using what happened with the Capitol Hill, you know, with the Capitol riots, they used that opportunity to kill Parler because they had the power to do it. And ultimately, if we don't in this country have some kind of restraints and restrictions on these social media companies at some point in the near future, conservatism in the public square is going to be killed. It's going to die. Because we are slowly seeing the purge happening, not just of Donald Trump, who's been kicked off of a bunch of social media platforms, not just Trump campaign people, but we're seeing people from the walkaway movement, which has really no official tie to Trump at all. We're seeing them get killed by Facebook. We're seeing this group called AR15.com, which is the world's largest gun forum. It's an online gun forum. People just go on there and talk about 
owning guns and firearms and stuff, you know, the constitutional right that you have to own a firearm. That website got killed by GoDaddy. Um, we have uh, an online retailer uh, that I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I can look it up, but they all they do is sell patriotic t-shirts and hoodies and stuff like that that just say God bless America and that kind of thing. They got banned on Facebook from advertising any of their products. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. It is starting to happen where they are pushing people out, not just out of social media platforms, but they're killing their website so that they can't even function. And all of the other server companies out there are turning companies like Parler down and saying, you know what? We don't want anything to do with you either. And so it is it is the, the greatest assault on speech that we have had in this country probably ever. It, and I really mean that in terms of the number of people being silenced in such a short period of time. I don't think this has ever happened before. It is terrifying. Yeah, I mean, I know what uh, I'm sure Jim is going to echo a lot of the sentiment that you have for sure. Uh, but I'm curious about Isaac's response to this. I, I haven't talked to you about this specifically. I'm curious about uh, uh, how you kind of perceive all of this. This has been the most concerned I've been about this. I know Justin's been ringing the bell on like Section 230 and stuff like this for quite a while. And I was skeptical. Um this, this was a little bit of a wake-up call for me in that, like, they always said, well, if you don't like Twitter, you don't like Facebook, get a different website. And <laughs> I was open to that, right? I was like, okay, yeah, that's fair. They're private companies. They get to do whatever they want. Like, that's the way that this works. But as soon as you get a different website and they say, well, no, you can't have that either, then it's like, oh, okay, I need to start canceling my Amazon account. I need to start using DuckDuckGo. I'm looking at getting rid of my Gmail and finding some other email thing. Like now I'm on tilt. I want to find every way that I can to reduce the number of dollars that I'm contributing to these, uh, these websites. I'm reducing the amount of time I'm on their platform. Unfortunately for me, like Twitter is useful for work because it helps me keep tabs on, you know, what the, uh, the other side quote unquote is doing in sure. Minnesota. So, um, you know, I'm encouraging people that don't have that kind of skin in the game to be like, well, yeah, what do you have to benefit from being on the platform anymore? So, yeah, right. Um, like yeah. you said, uh, uh, you don't like Twitter, make your own Twitter. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, right. And you know, that's we're... fine. Right. Like if you want to say go pound sand, like that's, that's their right. right. But if you don't like us not putting you on our app store, make your own app store. Okay. Yeah. We'll figure out a way that people can get our, our app anyways. Oh, okay. Well, we're not going to put you on our servers, make your own servers. <laughs> it's just like, at what point is it like, you know, make your own country now? Yeah. Like it, <laughs> honestly, like my breaking point was when Apple and uh, Google said that they weren't going to have the app in the app store. It was yeah, like, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, you know, Twitter and Facebook, whatever, they're just two websites on the internet. Right. But when Apple and uh, Android are basically together saying, okay, we own, I don't know what percentage of the mobile phone market, I'm sure it's like 90%. Plus, right. Right. Like, yeah. um, and there's kind of no alternative that just comes to mind. Like those are the two household brands. Like when they say that you can't get this app on either of them. And then Amazon says, we're not even going to host this website. It's like, okay, then now this is a problem. And <laughs> I need to, I need to acknowledge my own uh, complicity in this in like, I've got an Amazon prime account and I've known for a while that Amazon owns WAPO, right. And that sure. they support garbage. But um, it was like, well, they do provide a really good service. And that's something I'm willing to, that's not a hill I'm going to die on, right? In terms of like, I'm not going to do anything involving Amazon, but you know, what's the alternative? I think that's one thing that we should start to look at is, you know, you need a, a just a website hosted by, I don't know, somebody's basement, right? Uh, that shows you all the products and services that you need to be using instead of like Amazon, Facebook, sure. Twitter. Well, so. Jim, I mean, uh, Justin referred to this as like the biggest uh, uh, you know, anti free speech thing that he can recall. And how would you have guessed even a few years ago that that would be the result of private companies and not the government? I mean, it's, it's mm. where, where, what year are we in? Like, this is insane. Well, the government, these private companies are the most powerful corporations in the history of human civilization. They are much more powerful than government. Government actually has some restrictions. It's called the constitution on what it can and cannot do. Uh, corporations of this size, and they shouldn't have been to this size. And then I think you're going to see some 
you should see some antitrust uh, action taken against uh, these companies because they are more powerful than the government, which means obviously they are way too powerful. But do you know how many, um, as of yesterday, um, obviously the FBI has made some arrests in the uh, in, in the incident at the Capitol, at the Capitol building. Do you know how many of those uh, people that have been arrested had parlor accounts? Uh, I don't know, 20%. <laughs> zero, zero many what? had parlor really? accounts. Yes. And, um, uh, but they had Twitter accounts. And they had Facebook accounts. And so, you know, talking about, you know, the the, the real shocker uh, was was not just uh, Apple and Google Play taking uh, taking Parler, which before it was taken off was the number one downloaded app in the world. That's not easy to do. That means you're better than, I think number two at the time was Facebook and number four was Twitter. I mean, that is not easy to do for a company that didn't exist uh, two years ago. And can we even say that it's more remarkable considering the user interface for parlor was awful yeah oh yeah, yeah like not, it was a great. terrible app like they are blessed that they got that many people gab.com right. also uh advertising right. itself as a twitter alternative but yeah just had to get that off my chest right, <laughs> right. get well, better parlor well it they would, want to it would have you they know. want to but they, they can't right now so <laughs> look so but with amazon you know with amazon uh web services taking them taking them out and and i'm sure they've gone to GoDaddy and others that you know can you host surfs nope nope you know you, do, would you want to piss off the, the most powerful corporations in the world by taking parlor on i don't think so but we we live in a world you know it's really strange we live in a world where the owner of a small bakery is told to bake the damn cake right no matter his objections and we also live in a world where the largest social media companies, some of the largest corporations in the history of civilization, is not forced to just post the damn tweet or even keep an account up. So a, a Christian baker's business under law and culture is a public accommodation where you have to take on all comers. But Google and Amazon and Apple are not. That doesn't that makes no sense. What happened to Parler was basically or what's happening with all of this stuff with the free speech um, violations going on here. It really is the functional equivalent of a monopolistic phone company listening into your phone call, or or maybe you broadcast it out and they can hear it outside in the uh, outside in your yard, not liking what you and your brother are talking about on the phone and cutting off the phone line. Sure. Or just or just canceling the, the call, and then they they you try to do it again, and they cancel the call, and then you do it a third time, and now they actually go outside and physically uh, snip the line so that you can't communicate with your brother at all anymore. This is that that's what this is the most dangerous time for free speech in America in anyone's lifetime here. That is for sure. Um, and all of this is done supposedly because of safety. Right. Right. We, we, you can't. This is about words, guys. This is this is about people saying things and people will say these things in other ways, whether or not Twitter uh, thinks that they can stop this kind of speech by get by canceling people's accounts or just nuking parlor from space. These are thoughts people have about the election. These are thoughts people have about their government. And they will say these things. It, it may not be on your platform, but you're not stopping this and you, you're not making us more safe. By, by nuking the ability of half this country to speak from space. That is making us less safe, actually. Yeah. Talking, is, talking is better than what we saw at the Capitol building the other day. And a lot of the reason there were 200,000 or some people that marched on Washington on January 6th. A, a few hundred went to the Capitol and, um, and, and attacked it, you know, and tried to occupy it. And yet they now, not only is, our, is, is people like Nancy Pelosi and others treating everybody that went to Washington, D.C. as an insurrectionist and people, you know, committing sedition against the United States. Um, but, you know, they, they don't they don't even recognize why they were there. They were there because all summer, all year, they feel like their voices weren't heard. That's why people gather in large sure. numbers in public places in a rally to be heard. We spent all summer with protests all over the country with people trying to be heard heard. But we now live in a place, uh, Ace of Spades is a uh, great blog I, I read regularly. Ace, the guy who runs it, he says, um, he, he's mentioned this a lot in posts that he's done over the last couple of weeks, but that, you know, conservative speech is violence, but left-wing violence is speech. <laughs> That's basically where we are now. Right. And there is, there, and I just want to wrap this up by, there was a, um, there's a prominent uh, politician or a prominent person on Twitter who said this, and it's still up on Twitter, by the way, which is probably pretty dangerous. Quote, our election was hacked. There is no question. Congress has a duty to hashtag protect our democracy and hashtag follow the facts. The person who posted that those words on Twitter was Nancy Pelosi.
Sure. On May 17th, 2017, that tweet still exists. But if you or I were to say the exact same thing right now, it would be um, it would be take probably be removed from Twitter, and so would your account. Yeah. This this it, so this is madness, and this is very very dangerous. Yeah, I mean there there's a couple of good articles that kind of point to the the point that you just made, where it was just like this is this is done under the guise of trying to like protect us. When in reality, it's not. And uh, I won't I won't get into it, but I'll just mention that it'll be in the show notes. There's a couple of articles from Reason, one of them saying why purging social media of extremist speech might not make us safer. And it was the idea that's just like if you want people orchestrating their plans on, you know, criminal activity, like it's the most easy way to find them is if they're doing it on Facebook. Uh, but then the other one is in the aftermath of this purge that uh, millions of users are flooding encrypted apps after social media, you know, they, they took out parlor. So in these encrypted apps, it's going to be much harder to find people if they're trying to coordinate criminal activity than if they were to do it on Twitter or parlor or something like that. But if you want to read more about that, it'll be in the show notes. Uh, Justin, we have to start wrapping this up here, this segment. But uh, my question for you is like, where do, where do we go from here? Like what, what can we do to fight back other than, you know, Isaac's let's, let's do duck, duck, go and, get a Yahoo account or something. Yeah. I, I mean, in the short term, they're, they're really the only thing that we can do is hope that someone very wealthy starts building infrastructure that allows for free speech on the internet. <laughs> I mean, that's really all we can do. We have control. We, we, we don't have any control over government at all. And Congress is not going to do anything to stop this because they're all, in favor of it. In fact, they want stricter rules. A lot of the people who are in charge of Congress now, so they're not going to do anything to, to help the situation. I don't think courts are going to do anything to help the situation either. What we need in the long run is we need federal law in place that at the very least guarantees that if you're going to get the legal protection if you're, or the mandates, that if you're going to get the legal protection afforded to these social media platforms that have allowed them to exist, because there are special legal protections that are provided to them, you don't get this in a free market. They, they get it because of federal law. That if you're allowed to have these special legal protections, then one of the conditions of that is that you have to allow for free political, religious, and other forms of speech like that. You have to have it. Otherwise, you don't get those protections. And you should be treated like a publisher, like all the other publishers that are that are held liable when their writers say things that are defamatory or otherwise illegal. That needs to be a change in federal law. Or we need to just break up all these companies, these big, massive social media companies, or we need to do both. But I think there has to be some kind of federal law that that makes sure that these companies that can only exist because they're a creation of government rules that they, that they allow for free speech on the internet, because it is completely unjust that people like us should have to pay money to the federal government so that the federal government can then create laws and rules and regulatory structures that allow these companies to become the most powerful, as Jim said, some of the most powerful organizations in the history of the world, only so that they can then turn around and then silence the same people who are funding the government that allows these organizations to exist in the first place. These people have become billionaires off of our government, our government that we pay for. And then they turn around and they silence people that they don't like. That is completely and totally unjust and it should not be permitted. And, and one last thing, because I know I've, I'm going too long, but I, I think this is really important. Huh. Earlier, in the, earlier in 2020, the left was mocking, mocking Parler, saying that it's not even really a free speech zone. This was, this was the thing that they were saying all over the place. You can go find all sorts of articles where the left is talking like that, saying it isn't even really free speech. And, and there was this article in particular, there's a bunch of articles like this, but there was this article published in The Conversation, which is a publication that allows for academics to sort of debate topics. And in this, there's this academic who wrote this article uh, about Parler, just sort of a primer of what Parler is and whether it's really a free speech zone or whatever. And this is what it said after looking at its community standards and its terms of service. These are direct quotes. It says, a closer look at its user agreement, meaning Parler, suggests it moderates content the same way as any, uh, as any platform, maybe even more. 
Parler's community guidelines prohibit a range of content, including spam, terrorism, unsolicited ads, defamation, blackmail, bribery, and criminal behavior. Although there are no explicit rules against hate speech, there are policies against, quote, fighting words and, quote, threats of harm. This includes, quote, a threat of or advocating for violation against an individual or group. And then she further goes on to say these are rules, there are rules against content that is obscene, sexual, or lacks serious literary, artistic, political, and scientific value. For example, and then she talks about pornographic material. And then she says that the, the rules governing pornographic material are actually stricter on Parler than they are on Twitter. Hmm. So the idea that these people don't have rules, that this is just anarchy over at Parler, is absolutely not true. They do have rules. They do have guidelines. They don't allow for this kind of thing to happen. But just like Twitter, just like Facebook, just like every social media platform and every comment section of every website on the planet, they have not perfectly been able to control and eliminate all of this content. This is a this is a website that went from a few thousand people just two years ago, users, to more almost 20 million users. They are rapidly growing and they haven't been able to keep up with removing content as fast as they probably should or ideally would. But Twitter and Facebook, they don't remove content that quickly either. Right. And so maybe they're not quite as good as Facebook and Twitter at removing that stuff, but they are absolutely not this, this uh, you know, bastion of anything goes and hate yeah. speech and all of this, this way they're being painted. Online like, Somalia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, they're being painted like literally you can do anything on here. And right. it's just flat out not true. And the left was talking about this and criticizing Parler for promoting itself as a free speech zone not that long ago. Right. And so it's really important to keep that in mind. Do not believe that this is a anything goes versus a we need to have some rules. Both all of these platforms have rules. Yeah. This is about targeting a, a group that has become a safe haven for free speech, trying to get rid of it so that they can control speech and, pri and move out of their competitors and destroy their competitors because that's the other part of this too. They want to make money and they're all out to destroy yeah. a competitor. Isaac, uh, Jim, we got to wrap this up. Any last words on this topic? Isaac, nope. you are <laughs> muted. Oh, that was a Jim mistake. You're pulling a Jim. Oh, yeah. and, I, and I was just saying, Jim feels more passionately about this than I do, so I'd let him have the floor. <laughs> well, I think I, I, I had my little rant moment, so that's good. Uh, Justin yeah. got more uh, that time. Well, I mean, I really think that this emphasizes the need for the post office and the uh, the virtue of letter writing. Uh, yeah. because honestly, if you want to communicate with people without big government looking over your shoulder, you need to, uh, use the quill. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's a, in a bit of good news, just to, just today, I saw an article that says that Poland, the country of Poland plans to make censoring of social media accounts illegal. Um, leave it to a country that used to be behind the iron curtain to value free speech more than the United States. Well, and they burn tons of coal. So good for you, Poland. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think that like at the heart of this, it's kind of like a, a cultural, like it's a cultural war too that we're trying to face off here, right? And uh, you know, social media just seems to be kind of at the forefront of this thing. But another kind of industry that's at the forefront of all of that is the movie making industry and Hollywood and all of that. And to talk about all of this, I'm gonna bring on my next guest. So I'm just gonna throw it to myself for a minute. All right, joining me today, I have Del Dallas Sanye, film producer, publisher, entrepreneur, and founder of, I guess, what is now Bonfire Legend. How are you, good sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you know, so I, I kind of briefly mentioned this before we hit record, but on this podcast, and our audience will know this, we don't typically talk about movies too much. I mean, we did have an episode just a couple episodes back where we did, but that was kind of an outlier. Uh, generally, we're a public policy you know, organization, talk about that type of stuff. But I saw this story come across that was Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro's group, picked up the distribution rights to this new movie. Uh, called Run, Hide, Fight. And my first thought was, okay, what is this, like a documentary about school choice or something like that? Uh, but then I watched the trailer, and it couldn't have been further from that. Uh, yeah. So 
Uh, so maybe I should just start off by playing some of this trailer because sure. I think people will understand why I was so kind of taken back by this story once they see this trailer. So right. I'm going to go ahead and hit this real quick. In between breath, take the shot. You done really good out there, kid. The size of that deer, we're going to be eating venison all summer. Well, in a day's work. I think we need to see somebody again. And by we, you mean me? No, I mean us. Hey, that look in your eye. Guys in my unit had that look. You think there's a brochure you can hand me so I can go? Is that Chris Jellick over there? Is he doing something completely weird? Senior prank day. But we'll see all kinds of dumb stuff today. Swim captain, we'll have Thai food delivered to class, and Becky Vaughn will set up her homemade slip and slide. This is high school. Nothing that happens here matters in the real world. Okay, we are in charge now, so please pull out whichever app you use to do live streaming video. Get them up and running and point it at me. Now! Get down on the ground! Any more friends back there? I'm calling 911. Get back to your homeroom and stay put until the... You must be close. You should be ashamed! Very disturbing news out of Vernon Central High School. Zoe. In between breath, take a shot. Go! Is it safe to say that this might be our guardian angel? Do you want more people to die? That's the last thing I want. I'm gonna kill one person in this room every five minutes. You don't show your face. Isn't it ironic that after all your hard work, people aren't gonna remember you? No. They're going to remember me. All right. So I wasn't actually going to play the whole trailer, but I thought the trailer was just too good to stop at any good point there. So, uh, so yeah, as I was, as I was saying, that's no uh, documentary about school choice or anything. That is a full on movie. And I will say I got a sneak peek of it and it is awesome. Great. Oh, I'm so happy you liked it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Dude. I, I, I loved it. I was like, you know, I'm going to start it tonight and I'll finish it tomorrow. No, I watched the whole thing. So uh, I, no spoilers or anything like that. That's my non-spoiler review. It's awesome. People are going to really love this thing. I guarantee you that. Um, but OK, so let's get back to that kind of that main story here. Daily Wire obtained the distribution rights to this movie. It's not a typical move for Daily Wire. Uh, it's not a typical move for a movie. So how did this deal come about? Well, you know, the great Andrew Bright Breitbart you know, said uh, politics is downstream of culture. And uh, I, I took that to heart years ago as a young person and continue to uh, believe that it's true even more so today. So when I went into the movie business, I was uh, always, a, 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 you know, an open conservative. I, I wasn't uh, pushing any agendas or any sort of views down anyone's throat but I was never shy about the fact that I was not a liberal. And um, as I made my way through the entertainment industry and had more success and more success, I got interviewed more often and more often. And so, you know, the word started to kind of become that I was the Republican movie producer mm. and that's okay. I'm, I'm happy with that. Like uh, it is who I am. Uh, you know, it, it, so um, I ended up, uh, making this movie independently because no one would help me. I mean, I have made many movies that have made a lot of money for a lot of people. And uh, this was a script that was originally going to be produced by one of the major studios. 
they were going to buy it uh, in a deal called a spec script deal, hmm. and which is uh, the writer had written the script on spec and uh, was selling it to the studio. But unfortunately, the tragedy of Parkland happened and the studio got cold feet and pulled out. That is naturally when I got the call, as it tends to be when I get the call, when uh, a, 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 an agent in Hollywood has a script that they really believe in, they know is good, but they need a producer fearless enough to go in, in and make this. Uh, someone who can get it made and raise the money and get it cast and things like that. So I made the movie completely independently with literally no help from my traditional partners uh, in Hollywood and I ended up financing it independently through uh, Texas uh, investments, uh, family investments from Texas, across Texas. No shock there. So we made the movie. Um, the movie got into the Venice Film Festival, which is one of the oldest and most prestigious film festivals of all time. It played extremely well uh, in the room, but the few critics that got a link to it, keep in mind, you know, this is in the middle of COVID. And so not a lot of people are traveling. We did travel, um, but the critics did not. And they reviewed it uh, and just slaughtered the movie. Wow. I mean, slaughtered it. 0 for 5, I think we were. Uh, I think someone, I think Indie Wire gave us an F. <laughs> and, 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 and someone uh, correctly pointed out on Twitter that, you know, Dallas Sonia is going to take that as a badge of honor, which is true. <laughs> I knew. Sure, sure. I, look, I've made, I've made tons of movies. I've made great movies. I've made cl like stinkers. I know what's good and what's bad. It's not, a, a, and this movie is awesome. It is right. awesome. And so I felt that they were, I would say systemically, to use a word everyone loves to use these days, I thought they were systemically unfair to the movie based on subject matter yeah. um, and based on the uh, perception of politics that I had or the movie had or anything like that. So when we took the movie to the distribution community, we got a lot of passes, but then I would get these phone calls from my friends that worked at these companies, these distributed uh, distribution companies, and they would say, oh, Dallas, this movie is awesome. It's so good. We could never release it. Uh, you know, I wish we could, but we can't. And like, you know, I've got kids in private school. I can't lose my job over, you know, getting behind this movie. And so I thought, oh, gosh, this is terrible. I'm going to lose millions of dollars and really, you know, let down my investors. So I thought about some interesting Hail Marys. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of people in the conservative media space that like my movies. And mm -hmm. so I started sharing it with them and ultimately shared it with Ben Shapiro and Jeremy Boring. Uh, they watched it, loved it. We got on the phone. I told them, you know, what I needed to get a deal done. And to their credit, they made it happen. Um, so I owe them uh, so much gratitude here in this moment. Uh, and, and this movie has already reached more people uh, via the trailer on the Daily Wire YouTube than any of my movie trailers at this point. So that's a really fascinating, it, it's crazy how it all came together, but I am so excited right now. And I think what the Daily Wire is doing here for this movie and for our community is terrific. Yeah, and a couple of things to say, uh, uh, referencing some of the stuff that you were just saying there, it, like giving this movie an F or, you know, a zero or something out of five. It's like, you know, I, I've seen movies that have a good concept, but the production value is poor or something yeah. like that. It looks like a made for TV movie. Yeah. Like this is not that. Uh, this looks like a full on Hollywood produced movie that you would see if you went to the theaters and you'd be happy to see. Yes. And then not only that, the, the subject matter, uh, watching the trailer, even reading some of the comments, which I know you're never supposed to do in YouTube. But yeah, I'm, like the idea of a movie centered around like a, a school shooting seems like something well, you got to tread lightly around that. But I will say that like the way that this movie ex is executed um, it does not glorify any aspect of that whatsoever. Like it yeah. shows it in its most blunt form um, and just basically shows how terrifying it is, if anything. Yeah. So, yeah, you got all the praise in the world from me on this one, for sure. Well, thank you. I mean, we never we never set out to have a message behind any movie, no, no matter what. It is entertainment. 
and fiction above all. But naturally, when you make a movie about an active shooter in a school, uh, there's going to be a conversation surrounding it. Right. I would say the answer is different for everyone involved. Uh, but for me, uh, it was two things. One, when you watch the movie, you will be surprised or maybe even disgusted that the lockdown procedures mm. are as antiquated and ridiculous and slow and ultimately unhelpful uh, as they are in the movie, you, you will honestly not believe them. You'll sure. think, oh, this is a movie. These guys got it wrong. No, no, no. We got it right. We used uh, one of the um, top experts who worked for the Department of Homeland Security for years over several administrations, uh, checking all of this, the script details and things like that. Um, the second thing, which was more personal. So I've had enormous amount of tragedy in my life. I lost both of my parents uh, to separate domestic gun violence situations. Uh, my mom was uh, killed by her uh, husband, um, I guess my, my, my stepfather, if you will, um, uh, when she was uh, trying to pack her bags and get a divorce. Um, and that was uh, two years later to the date, my father came home and was gunned down in his house uh, by a man related to uh, someone who was jealous of my father for dating uh, a woman in town. And so you would think that someone like me would not want to sort of make a movie like this after what I've experienced in my life. But I am of the opinion that it was my responsibility to make a movie like this. Um, I think about my parents and the fact that they were both in many ways ambushed and didn't have a chance to fight back. So for me, Run, Hide, Fight is, is the uh, sort of personification manifestation of, of me celebrating the legacy of my parents and they were so amazing and uh, trying to, you know, get in the, get in the fight and give, give them a chance to sort of uh, emotionally fight back in many ways. Wow. Wow. Um, so da Daily Wire picking this up, and I know you kind of explain the specifics that are around this movie that kind of made it difficult to kind of go the traditional route. Um, so is this kind of a, is this move an outlier or is this like a sign of things to come? This is absolutely a sign of things to come. Whew. So I thought when I went out to Los Angeles as an 18 year old, I went to USC film school, had a great time at, at USC, had a blast, uh, went and worked for a major talent agency. Um, I ultimately become a re uh, became a representative myself and worked it, you know, as uh, the, the first manager for Greta Gerwig and for Leslie Headland, who has, you know, Russian Doll on Netflix and is uh, making an, a Star Wars project. Um, you know, I, I discovered and represented all these incredible people. Um, and, and, and literally, there was always something that w I was a disconnect uh, in, in Hollywood. People found me rough around the edges, too ambitious, too direct. Everyone's so insecure in the way that they are so passive aggressive. And I was just like a, like a battering ram. And so, and so I think ultimately the corporatization of Hollywood and the fact that it has gone so far left um, it is so uh, frustrating to me. I don't, I don't want to be tribal and in our own camps, uh, uh, but, but that's where we're heading. That's where we are right now. And so I don't want um, I don't want to, to sort of say that I'm a crusader in a culture war, but basically I'm making movies that no one is making right now because they're too afraid, yet they all love my movies, they all watch my movies, uh, and only the fringe weirdos on the left, really get bothered by them. And so that's fine. I'll always have the the vocal haters on Twitter and in the, some of the mainstream media, things like that. But my audience is very, very uh, loyal and they keep coming back to my movies over and over. And I think now with the partnership of the Daily Wire with this juggernaut of a marketing machine, uh, sky's the limit. And I hope I make a ton of movies with them, uh, TV series and things like that. 
we are so aligned in our goals and values and, and the ways we make movies. Uh, I think it's going to be a big, big success. And, and I think it's going to be the first of many. Okay. Very, very cool. That That's, it's a pretty exciting thing. So recently I kind of referenced this. Um, I had a, a, another interview just a couple of weeks back. We talked to Christian Toto, who's like a conservative ish uh, movie reviewer. And I posed this question, but I want to see your opinion on it too, which is like, it's just, it, is this new lurch to the left in Hollywood? Is that like really a new thing? Or are we just paying closer attention to it? Like, what was it? back in the past when it came to making movies, because it didn't seem like it was this, you know, we have to make sure that we put orange man bad in here and we have yeah. to have like uh, specific things that we touch on. Like what's going on here? Yeah. Well, uh, Christian Toto is obviously one of my favorite writers. And if anyone hasn't heard that uh, interview that you had with him, they should go back and listen to it because it was fantastic. Um, it, it's, it's new ish. Okay. So, I think we can all look at Obama's second term as the twist in the culture uh, when there started to become more intersectionality, uh, more hypocrisy, more disingenuous morality, all these things. And, 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 and I think for folks like me, probably folks like you and your audience, I think we were, we were busy like building businesses and raising our families and focusing on, you know, just living our lives. When I believe that the uh, extreme voices on the left were basically plotting this absolute takeover, takeover of all cultural institutions. Certainly academia has been decades. Uh, the movie industry, things like that has just, They've gone so far left. And I think a lot of it is peer pressure and insecurity, people not being willing to sort of go out on their own. I mean, I have been attacked mercilessly uh, based on my politics and things like that. But the interesting thing is, as long as I make great movies and stick to it and don't bend a knee, I think I will continue to uh, make movies that Hollywood can't deny. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I have projects that, New Line and Netflix and all those stuff. So in, in many ways, I'm I'm living sort of this dual lifestyle. You know, out of Texas, we're based out of Texas, um, where I'm still I still have one foot in the business and in the industry uh, traditional, but I'm also really excited about building uh, more ecosystems that are alternative media, replacement media, to use Jeremy Boring's term over at the Daily Wire. I just think it's a terrific. Uh, it's a must. I didn't start the fire, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't create this war. Uh, I thought I was going to be like making movies at Paramount. Mm -hmm. uh, when I grew up, my my favorite movie, you know, was stuff like Top Gun. So I I I just was a, a populist kid watching populist entertainment and thought the movie industry was populist, but it was it was it was the conformity of 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 the corporations first and sort of the big media cor corporations. And then they became sort of exposed to the predominantly millennial generation in their ranks who, uh, you know, just simply requires them to behave a certain way. Well, I've had my own fair share of run-ins with, with that. And, you know, I think now uh, it, it, after sort of in this post-Trump moment, but also, uh, as, as the country gets more and more divided and more tribal, we are going to have to create uh, alternative uh, conservative economies, whether it's conservative movies, um, clothing brands, uh, all kinds of stuff. But where, where you shop for gas uh, in, in any day now is going to be a political decision. It is going to invade everything. And so, uh, I, all I'm, all I'm going to do is continue to be me and make the movies that I love making. And if those naturally over time uh, become conservative, well, then that's the way it goes. And I'm, I'm happy to carry that mantle. See, I, I, you know, I was having this conversation with a colleague of mine recently, and it was like, 
I, I was struggling with this idea of like, are these big corporations really woke or is this just like a financial choice that they're making? So one of my, one of like the favorite, um, one of my favorite movie review channels on YouTube is, is called red letter media. And they really get into some of this stuff. And by the way, they are a humongous fan of bone Tomahawk specifically. So <laughs> yeah. just, just an FYI there. They love, they love my movies, <laughs> but uh but, uh, you know, they had talked about like they were in one of their segments, they were talking about the kind of the difference between like the original Star Wars movies where George Lucas basically just like, you know, was able to put some money together. He's got some ideas and, you know, skeleton crew. He went out and put this thing that became like, you know, like for the, the bang for the buck, like you couldn't have cashed in bigger than the original Star Wars sure. compared to today where it's like you've got this movie, whether it's, um, you know, Rise of Skywalker or something like that, that seems like it's made by a committee. You know, there's yeah. no real heart going into it. It seems like it's all these business decisions. We got to make sure that we have all of these things to not upset certain people and have a, a representation and all this stuff. There doesn't seem to be that same heart that like the original Star Wars was made with. So I'm kind of wondering if it isn't necessarily an ideological thing, but just like a financial thing that's got this little uh, a veneer of social justice over it or something like that. Well, I think it has a lot to do with a, a generational thing. I mean, I think if you look at all of the cancel, the, 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 the book publishing business has been really interesting, seeing all the books getting canceled. Sure. Uh, the folks who internally at those companies are ringing the bell they're not my age. They're not older than me. Hmm. They are they are in the millennial generation. And, and it's going to take another approximately eight years for that generation to move through the advertising demo. It just is. Uh, and so when you look at some of the early statistical data on the two generations uh, after the millennials, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, which I have three kids in Gen Alpha, um, there is some uh, interesting data that points to a more capitalistic viewpoint and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I have great sympathy uh, for the millennials. I've tried my hardest to, uh, you know, uh, really sort of support them in, in, in my company and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so they, they have, I mean, if you, if you were born in 1990, can you imagine the stuff you've gone through you know, starting and starting like when you graduate high school in 2008, it's like, Oh gosh, like I just can't, you know, I, so I, I have a lot of empathy for them, but, um, you gotta, you know, you got to learn personal responsibility. You've got to learn mental toughness. You have to pull up your boots by the straps. Like I don't care if AOC tweets that that's not, you know, possible or, or that that's, you know, a privilege. I don't care that it, it's, it's the way I live my life. You've got to do it. So I think that it's, it's ultimately going to be really necessary for uh, folks like us to support the companies and uh, the people that are willing to stand up and to create content, distribute content, run businesses that say, I'm not going to buy into uh, critical race theory and all of these different things. I'm not going to force my um, employees to, you know, it, it sort of uh, go through these training process. I, I think that's absolute garbage mentality and I just won't celebrate victimhood. So. You yeah, know, I'm 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 a I'm a I'm an outlier for sure in my business, but hopefully I can create enough opportunity that we can start to to build some trends here in the show. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like there is a growing community, especially online, uh, YouTube, of, of people that just like reject some of these movies that are coming out, whether it's like kind of the newer Star Wars movies or uh, Wonder Woman was like a disaster or anything like that. And instead kind of developing a brand loyalty to, you know, like the movies that uh, that you were producing, uh, right. Brawl and Cell Block 99, Dragged Across Concrete, uh, Bone Tomahawk, I've already mentioned a couple of times. So uh, I, I just wonder... I guess kind of separate from that, but you know, with the, with all the COVID stuff, the, the lockdowns right. and theaters are just struggling to survive. Studios are pushing movies months, if not years down the road. Yeah. Uh, what, what is the future, especially with streaming yeah. and, and all like the, the, the 
tons of different streaming services. Like, what's the future of the movie industry, in your opinion? Well, is the uh, era of like a billion dollar movie over? It's not over because that's all that will be in theaters moving forward. Mm -hmm. If theaters make it through. So keep in mind, these movie theater companies, they are saddled with hundreds of millions of dollars of debt, insurmountable debt. Uh, they may never come back. Um, I think it takes, you know, 30 days to make a new habit, 60 days to break an old habit. We are so far beyond that in terms of our timeline. Um, Believe it or not, movie theaters in Texas have been open since you know May. I've been eight times to movie theaters, believe it or not. Uh, I try to see everything. Um, other, It's funny. Other than Freaky on opening night, because my buddy Vince Vaughn, you know, I had to go support him. I love that movie. It's so okay, funny. great. I was very um, curious to watch that one. I'm glad so, you <laughs> He is so committed. It's great. Uh, there, was, there was five people in that theater. Mm. And then I went and saw Infidel. Uh, one random afternoon, and there was probably 15, 20 people in that theater. Um, other than that, the other six or so times I've gone to the theater, I was one of one or one of two people in the entire theater, and it wasn't on off hours. So I think we have to look to the past to sort of address the future. Um, I can't necessarily determine what the future is going to be, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do about it. Uh, I'm looking at the late 1960s when the Hollywood movie, uh, they were out of touch. They were these giant musicals and Torah, Torah, Torah and Hello, Dolly, you know, uh, uh, just just really sort of uh, these movies that were sort of losing touch, losing steam. And in comes the new Hollywood, as they were called in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And it really kind of, in my opinion, started with Bonnie and Clyde, Warren Beatty, and then also uh, Easy Rider, okay? Mm. I believe that Easy Rider, if made today, sort of the, the, the spirit of Easy Rider is not coming from a liberal filmmaker. Hell, they're the man already. Right. A renegade. Easy Rider is going to come from a conservative filmmaker or a filmmaker who has the, the, the freedom, the sort of free thinking, free speech, freedom of assembly values. And I think it's going to come from that camp. So I understand that I need to build infrastructure with partners like the Daily Wire to be able to give more opportunities to filmmakers who want to keep to, you know, keep working in this space, mm -hmm. who don't want to make uh, sort of agenda movies in Hollywood and things like that. Um, the funny thing is, you make a non-agenda movie today, it ends up becoming a, a conservative or right-wing movie. <laughs> All right. That's where we're at. But so I think, uh, you know, I've been studying uh, uh, the Peter Biskin book, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls. I've been studying all the 1970s. I think we're going to go through a cultural renaissance of filmmaking. And I think it will look very different than what you're seeing now. And I think it will look very reminiscent of what you saw in the late 60s, early 70s. So I'm very yeah. excited about it. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you know what? And that's probably a good way. L let's end this interview on a hopeful note there. Um, but uh, just for, for everybody that's, you know, listening to this, where can they go to watch the new movie, Run, Hide, Fight? Great. So uh, my company is called Bonfire Legend. We are only on Instagram. Uh, can't, can't handle the cesspool of Twitter. Uh, uh, Bonfire Legend. Um, we partnered up with the Daily Wire uh, tomorrow night or, or January 14th. It's live on um, on YouTube. Other than that, it will be on the Daily Wire uh, website and, uh, you know, become a subscriber, support the Daily Wire, watch the movie. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. All right. Fantastic. Oh, stay on with me uh, after I end this, because I do have another question for you. That I want to do off air. But uh, Dale Asanye, thank you for being on with me, sir. Thanks for having me. It's a great time. Great. All right. Fantastic. Well, gentlemen, we are out of time here. Uh, any, any last words, any, any bits of wisdom, anything you want to get off your chest before we wrap up for this? Why time? didn't you let us ask any questions during the interview? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just shut you guys out. Completely. Yeah. You completely hogged all of the, the potential commentary. Yeah, Don Donnie is the, is the Twitter fascist of this podcast. He basically canceled us during that last yeah, he, 30 minutes. Everybody mute everybody, right? That now. was not cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I just want to I just want to say like a sort of a final word to everybody that I'm OK. 
everything's all right. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I haven't been taken hostage. I haven't been fired from the Heartland Institute. I sure as heck haven't been fired from this stupid podcast. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so also, <laughs> uh, I do want to say congrats, everybody. Uh, Justin's Twitter followers have fallen substantially during the last week and a half. And I can only credit the uh, unfollow Justin movement for that series of events. So, guys, I know that there's a lot of you know negativity and pessimism right now, but I think this is a time for us to be like really encouraged by our successes. Yeah, so hashtag unfollow Justin. Unfollow Justin. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning into this week's episode. Please tune in every Friday for a new episode of the In the Tank podcast. If you like our show, please subscribe, write a review for us on iTunes. It'd be greatly appreciated. You could pretty much find us on everything. Um, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, whatever. Except find for Parler, because you can't find anything <laughs> on Parler. Good point. If you'd like, you can follow us at don't follow us at Twitter. Just forget it. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna delete our account. Like just it's just so pointless at this delete point. your own Twitter, delete your own Facebook. Yeah. Don't keep up with any friends or family. Yeah. Just <laughs> feel, feel free to pit in a field somewhere and stock it with rations. <laughs> Email us at in the tank podcast at gmail.com. Uh, Jim, where can the fine people find you? Uh, you can still find me at Twitter at Jay Lakely, but you should probably, if you want to contact me or talk with me, just leave comments underneath this video on YouTube. Um, there you go. We're, we're probably going to move from at, at some point anyway. We'll be forced to because we are dangerous. That's right. Isaac Orr, where can the fine people find you? Nowhere. I'm off the grid, baby. <laughs> it just sends smoke <laughs> signals. Justin, where can the fine people find you? Uh, they can send telegrams and any messages via Pony Express to the Heartland Institute headquarters in Arlington Heights, Illinois. They will then in turn send me a telegram and I will try to send a telegram back to the headquarters. We'll then send a telegram back to you, but it's going to take a little while. So <laughs> like six months later, <laughs> six months later, you'll get a response. All yeah, right. just keep that in mind. Yeah. It's going to be Carry a while. Carrier pigeon, too. That, that works. Br brush up on your Morse code, everybody. All right. Handy. All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. We'll talk to you next week.